Chief of the Coastal Command, Air Chief Marshal Sir W. Shalto Douglas. This film has been produced to provide in pictorial form a summary of the organization and scope of the anti-U-boat operations in the North Atlantic of Coastal Command. These operations have virtually been the end-all and be-all of our existence since September the 3rd, 1939. After many vicissitudes, they were crowned with signal success in 1943 and justified in one vital field at any rate, the phrase victory through our power. Although Coastal Command is primarily concerned with anti-U-boat operations, yet it has other activities of paramount importance which interlink closely with its main function. These activities may be summarized as follows. Meteorological reconnaissance. Special squadrons, both in Britain and overseas, flying long distance sorties and making vertical ascents. These findings are necessary to the planning of all Allied air and naval operations. For preceding every action must come the forecast chart. Air Sea Rescue. This service, which aids all Allied flying crews, was established in 1941 and works in cooperation with the Royal Navy. Motor and sail lifeboats are dropped. Ships home by aircraft to crews ditched far from land. High-speed launches sent to those near shore. The result? One-third of all crews ditching in the sea have been picked up. Photographic reconnaissance. During 1943, unarmed Spitfires and other light fast aircraft flew over 3,000 sorties to map targets and assess bomb damage. Bordeaux, Heligoland, the Tirpitz, the Bismarck, the Hipper, the Brest, the Eder Dam, anti-shipping. Low fighters and albacores equipped with rocket projectiles, torpedoes and bombers. Their job, to disrupt the enemy supply lines along the Dutch and French coasts. Their achievement, the port of Rotterdam virtually closed, thousands of tons of shipping sunk, and attacks made on e-boats which attempted to interfere during the first landings in France. And now the main story, coastal command against the U-boat in the Battle of the Atlantic. The Battle of the Atlantic has never ceased, but as early as 1941, as the Churchill stated, I hope you will believe me when I say that I have complete confidence in the Royal Navy, aided by the Air Force of the Coastal Command, and that in one way or another, I am sure they will be able to meet every changing phase of this truly mortal struggle. The first phase, new boats in operation, only a dozen or so. Their aim, to seal the entrances to the English Channel and the North Sea. Coastal Command at this point has only 19 squadrons, all equipped. Then Norway and France fall, and the U-boats, about a hundred now, gain valuable strategic bases. Medium-range coastal aircraft drive them from the North Sea, and so they attempt a blockade of Britain on the west, and nearly succeed. To protect the convoy lanes and the Lend-Lease cargo streaming over them, Coastal begins to operate from Iceland, Northern Ireland and west of England, and forces the enemy farther out into the Atlantic. Submarine strength, 150 U-boats. December the 7th, and the U-boats swarm to American waters. Their number has soared to 300. For Coastal, this is an interval of expansion and development. For the U-boats, it is a period of triumph. Then the crisis, 400 U-boats. And during the first 10 days of March 1943, they sink over 600,000 tons of Allied shipping, most of it in a region beyond reach of long-range aircraft. But during this same period, Coastal Institute's very long-range aircraft. And from here on, the air battle against the U-boat is offensive rather than defensive. It is the story of that offensive battle which this film attempts to tell. Periscope. Lethal bulk rising from the sea. This is the enemy. 
A U-boat is conceived and born far from the waters in which it is launched. Individual parts, diesel engines for surface power, electric motors and batteries for submerged running, are built in factories dispersed throughout the interior of Germany and are then shipped to construction and assembly yards along the coast, Augsburg, Kiel, Bremen. Again and again, these U-boat centers have been priority targets for the American and Royal Air Force Bomber Commands. But although production has been interrupted and impaired, it has not been halted. The U-boats have priority with Germany too. Priority of raw materials, priority of labor. Even now, with factories and yards under repeated attack, it is estimated that U-boats are being produced at the rate of about 24 per month, and that there are at present some 450 of them, of which about 250 are likely to be operational at one time. Aside from the small type used for training, there are four main classes of U-boats. Largest are the 1600 tonner and 1200 tonner. The first, a supply boat, also equipped for mine laying. The second, a long-range cruiser. Next in size are the 740 and 500 ton boats. The 500 tonner is a standard type. More of these are launched than any other kind. And more are sunk. The usual duration of their patrol is six weeks. And they normally carry a crew of 43, five officers and 38 men. No single factor in a U-boat's efficiency is more important than the morale of these men. And recently, that morale has become a matter of hopeful conjecture. The maximum surface speed of the 500-ton U-boat is about 18 knots. Cruising speed, 11 knots. Submerged, the maximum speed is about 9 knots. But at this rate, the batteries will become exhausted in two hours, and the boat will be forced to surface. At slow submerged speeds, the batteries will last for 60 hours. The deck armament is increasingly anti-aircraft. Quadruple 20 millimeter guns, and sometimes a 37 millimeter. These guns are contained in two bandstands aft of the bridge, and are fitted with protective shields for the gunners. The efficiency of all the guns depends on their sensitivity to submersion. In fact, diving puts a strain on everything connected with a U-boat. It wears out the batteries, and it wears out the crew, both mentally and physically. That is part of Coastal Command's campaigning, to make the boats go down often and to keep them down. The other part is to kill them whenever and wherever possible. A U-boat can submerge in 20 seconds. Acceptance trials in the Baltic. Then the first patrol. The U-boats set out. They proceed surface to these Norwegian ports. Some remain based here in order to attack convoys bound for Russia. But the majority head out into the Atlantic and to work. Returning from patrol, most U-boats go to ports along the Bay of Biscay. Ports often attacked by Bomber Command. Here, the traffic is two-way. Boats returning to be resupplied and refitted, others going out to resume their patrols. In these two main transit passages, off Iceland and in the bay, Coastal Command has established offensive anti-U-boat patrols, the most effective single stratagem in the winning of the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, the theory of the offensive anti-U-boat patrol is based on the fact that a U-boat, adopting cautious tactics, cannot travel a distance of more than 120 miles in 24 hours, and that at some stage during this period, she must surface in order to recharge her batteries and top up with high-pressure air. Thus, a U-boat which last surfaced here will have to resurface before it reaches here. A U-boat needs at least 30 minutes on the surface in order to derive even a minimum charge. Our aim is therefore to patrol an area approximately 120 miles wide with sufficient aircraft to ensure that during these 30 minutes the U-boat is detected and exposed to attack. That means, in effect, that every point within this patrol area must be covered at least twice every hour. This is a typical Bay of Biscay patrol known as Percussion T. It is designed for four aircraft sweeping north and south, separated 20 miles apart. 
these aircraft may be drawn either from the same base or from different bases. At the extremity of the patrol, each aircraft runs east 10 miles and then sweeps northwards and sail back to its base. 30 minutes after the first wave of aircraft has started, a second wave follow in order to preserve the frequency of cover. These patrols may be laid on either in other areas of the Bay of Biscay or anywhere else where we may expect to find U-boats in passage. Percussion is the code name for these bay patrols and T represents but one area covered. Other letters designate other areas. The patrol in each of these areas is flown in the same manner as that described for percussion T. The aircraft used for offensive patrols have developed in speed and range from the Walrus and the Anson, both short range and now obsolescent, to the medium range Hudson, now equipped with rocket guns, and long range flying boats carrying depth charges, the 250 pound torpex filled depth charge, which is the usual weapon employed by coastal aircraft against the U boat. Day and night, these offensive patrols are flown, fortresses and others by day, and at night by Wellingtons and Liberators fitted with a Lee light, whose beam illuminates the target below. Long-range Liberators are also flown, both by Royal Air Force Squadrons and British Base Squadrons of the United States Navy Fleet Air Wing 7, which since 1943 have been working with Coastal Command in maintaining anti-U-boat patrols in the Bay of Biscay. The United States Navy carries out the patrols as requested by Coastal, but it has complete charge of the maintenance and operation of its own units. Although the primary job of these American Liberator crews is anti-U-boat patrol, they have also been active and effective in keeping the Bay of Biscay clear of German blockade runners. Many of the men saw action in the Pacific before being transferred to England, where they have replaced United States Army Air Force squadrons doing similar work. The average cruising speed of the long-range Liberator is 160 miles an hour. Like all coastal aircraft on patrol, it flies long sorties, 10 hours. Other aircraft, the very long-range Liberators and the Sunderland flying boats stay out even longer, 14 and 15 hours. Because of these long sorties, monotony and flying fatigue are additional hazards facing crews on anti-U-boat patrol, along with bad weather, and danger from U-boat and enemy aircraft fire. The Lee Light Wellingtons continue the offensive anti-U-boat patrols during the night. These night Wellingtons have been in use since 1942. The Lee Light they carry is operated in conjunction with radar. The light has proved to be one of the most effective of all anti-U-boat devices. Now, a demonstration of the light. First, the men chiefly concerned with it, pilot and co-pilot, wireless operator, navigator, the radar operator watching for blips on his screen. These blips record surfaced objects miles away on the sea below. Now a blip, a sighting has been made. The pilot is informed. The navigator notes the aircraft's location and the wireless operator transmits a sighting report. The navigator comes back to lower the light. Switch radar off. The pilot now has the course. Down comes the light. The co-pilot goes forward to control the light from the nose. The aircraft loses altitude, preparing to attack. The navigator mans the nose gun, straddling the co-pilot. A mile from the U-boat, the pilot orders the radar on again. The light is ready to be switched on. The tail gunner is ready for anything. The radar operator now homes the pilot directly to the U-boat. Closer. Stand by. Light on. Depth charge is poised. 
Organization of Coastal Command, Headquarters, then four home-based operational groups, each conforming geographically to a naval command area, and each made up of individual operational stations. Sixteen group attack surface shipping along the enemy coast. The other three groups are anti-U-boat groups. 19 Group carries out anti-U-boat patrols in the Bay of Biscay and helps supply air escort to convoys bound to and from Gibraltar. 15 Group provides air cover for convoys in the western approaches of the Atlantic. 18 Group attacks enemy shipping off the Norwegian coast, protects convoys bound for Russia, and flies anti-U-boat patrols off Iceland. Headquarters, Coastal Command, the mainspring of a vast machine of action. Here is formulated the strategy for the air battle of the Atlantic. Policies are determined and tactics planned by the Commander-in-Chief and his staff in liaison with the Air Ministry and the Admiralty. The Admiralty estimates where the U-boats are and will be, and Coastal decides how best to get at them by air. Once the plan is established, then orders go out to the home base groups and overseas bases for detailed execution. Thus, from the beginning, the Royal Navy and the Air Force work in close collaboration. Within Britain, direct telephone lines connect to the home base groups. Scramblers for secret conversations. Wireless for overseas bases. Amplifications and confirmations in code are sent from headquarters to group by teleprinters. This, then, is the start of a chain of command. Headquarters, the central coordinating brain. The groups, the nerve centers. 19 Group at Plymouth is representative of all coastal anti-U-boat groups in organization and activities. With the Navy and defense elements of the Army, it is housed in an area combined headquarters. In two of the switchboards of group, telephone and teleprinter come the orders and requests from headquarters. The teleprinter switchboard connects with the machines on which the messages are received. Through pneumatic tubes they are shuttled to the traffic room and from there to the cipher room for decoding. This work is done on Typex machines which can not only decipher messages that can put them into cipher. In the operations room at group, the specific plan of battle is drawn up. Headquarters has designated the why and the where. Now group determines the how. The commander-in-chief, Admiral Sir Ralph Latham. The air officer commanding, Air Vice Marshal B.E. Baker. And with them here at 19 group, the United States Navy's fleet air wing representative. Decisions made are recorded on the aircraft movements board. Which stations can be used most effectively for the task? How many aircraft will be needed? How long each will be on patrol? While tomorrow's work is being planned, a running commentary on today's work is kept. Plottings of U-boat sightings and of aircraft. At the same time, the Navy keeps check on the convoys in the area and their surface escorts. Group is able to receive immediate notification of all these movements by means of wireless, through which it maintains contact with aircraft in flight. Aircraft wireless operators listen out during certain prearranged periods in each hour. They send messages only in emergencies, when new boats are sighted or attacked, and enemy aircraft encountered. Such messages received at group are relayed to headquarters. The chain of command continues from headquarters to group, to the operational stations in the group. A typical coastal station is St. Evel in Cornwall, one of several 19 group stations active in covering the critical Bay of Biscay region. During the Battle of Britain, St. Evel was a frequent target for the Luftwaffe. 
but its operations never ceased. This is a Liberator station, the very long-range Liberator, which in early 1943 finally bridged the mid-Atlantic gap. From the wireless station, messages are sent to airborne aircraft. Transmission is made by the indirect method, so as not to reveal the aircraft's location. The wireless cabin is in the operations block. The listening out watch here is a duplication of that maintained at group to which the aircraft normally directs its messages. Briefings are held in the operations room. Here, just before takeoff time, a crew enters to receive final counsel. In other words, their own words, to get the gen. All coastal briefings follow the same pattern. The mission today is a patrol of a particular area taped on the map. And, as usual, it is in the Bay of Biscay. The station intelligence officer opens the briefing, indicating the route in and out and the type of patrol to be flown. Now, the enemy airdromes from which long-range fighters may be sent out and what type they are likely to be. Next, signals. The wireless gen the Morse call letters for the day, the code word to be used for radio telephone identification. Positions of aircraft at sea are radioed as secret coordinate letters rather than as actual latitude and longitude figures. Finally, the weather. And this means the weather for the 13 or more hours the aircraft will be in flight, depression areas, warnings of cold or warm fronts, cloud cover, visibility, an estimate of icing conditions. Weather is Coastal's most unrelenting enemy. Now to work. The aircraft is waiting at its hard stand, fully serviced by the ground crew, and bombed up with depth charges. This is the beginning of a long, long day. The takeoff. Runway racing fast. Start of a thousand mile journey. A few miles to the coast are soon covered. The coast is near. From here on, there will be no identifiable land points, only an endless track of water. Then, over the coast. One last look. Once, in civilian life, these men were bank clerks, school teachers, professional footballers, men from Britain, Canada, from South Africa, and down under. Today, they speed through clouds, useful for purposes of concealment, hunting the U-boat. The guns are tested. Eyes constantly sweep the sky for signs of enemy aircraft. upper turret on the watch. The wireless operator, ears and voice of the aircraft, and the radar operator, its long-range eye. These can be aimed at aircraft above or U-boat decks below. Coastal aircraft fly at relatively low altitudes, usually between 1,000 and 1,500 feet. The bombing level is normally 50 feet. The depth charges are aimed so as to straddle the U-boat. Their lethal range is 19 feet, and they are set to explode at a 25-foot depth. Coastal Command Overseas, Iceland. Northern outpost of a vast interlinking system of transatlantic air coverage. Coastal has been operating here since early 1941. It uses Meeks Field, the United States Army Field, as a secondary and diversionary base. But its main base is at Reykjavik. The normal air approach is from the northwest over the harbor and the town. The Reykjavik Airdrome was once an undrained swamp, and its broad runway extends to the sea. Coastal anti-U-boat squadrons in Iceland have two main jobs. They provide air escort for convoys sailing the northern route, and they maintain a permanent patrol over the passage used by U-boats heading out into the mid-Atlantic. Intermittently, over various periods, American squadrons, both Army and Navy, have cooperated in this work. 
Now, off to a job. And on the job, escorting a convoy off Iceland, en route to British ports. Now, Gibraltar. For almost 250 years, Gibraltar has been a British stronghold. Until this war, it has been identified chiefly with the Army and the Royal Navy, guarding its straits. Today, it belongs to the Royal Air Force as well. From the Europa Point on the south to the Spanish mainland on the north, the promontory is only three miles long and from 600 yards to one and a half miles wide. But out of this has been created one of the world's great airdromes. The very name Gibraltar has come to be a synonym for fortification. But today the guns that bristle from its crest are supported by a new weapon of defense, giant radar beacons, day and night sweeping the sky for any sign of approach by the enemy. Dissecting the airfield's runway is the road which carries all traffic to and from Spanish territory only a few hundred yards away. The problem of physical security is dealt with by traffic policemen acting in coordination with the field's flying control. But the problem of military security, even with the aid of a nightly curfew, is another and more complicated matter. The field north front was once a sandy plain used as a race course. The runway is 2,000 yards long and 150 yards wide, and it cuts straight across from east to west, with one end meeting the Mediterranean and with the other extending out into Algeciras Bay. Lined up at North Front is Gibraltar's defense flight of Spitfires and Hurricanes, used for short-range reconnaissance and which stand by ready for fighter action against attack from the air. The harbor of Gibraltar is formed by the horseshoe curve of Algeciras Bay, and a section of it, called New Camp, is used as a flying boat base. British based flying boats are often diverted here following their Bay of Biscay patrols, sometimes because it is nearer, sometimes because of weather, sometimes for resurfacing, and sometimes for battle damage repairs. 37 millimeter shells from a U boat splintered this Catalina's pedestal and wing. The hangars at New Camp are equipped for the complete overhaul both of Catalinas and Sunderlands. Once the boats are reserviced, they are ready to undertake another patrol while en route back to their home bases in Britain. Tunneled 500 yards into the rock is the war room, center of the area combined headquarters for Army, Navy, and Air Force. The present air officer commanding at Gibraltar is Air Vice Marshal William Elliott. He was preceded by Air Vice Marshal Sterley Simpson, here shown in conference with the Commander-in-Chief, Vice Admiral Sir Harold Butter, and his staff. From Gibraltar, Coastal carries out anti-U-boat patrols and escorts convoys approaching and leaving the Mediterranean. Operations within the Mediterranean itself are under the control of the Mediterranean Allied Air Forces Command. Iceland. The United Kingdom, Gibraltar. Linking with these coastal command bases in anti-U-boat coverage are the bases of the Eastern Air Command of the Royal Canadian Air Force and the United States Navy's Eastern Sea Frontier. But until 1943, there was a critical gap. Then that gap was filled from the Azores. Great Britain obtained use of the Azores through an almost 600-year-old treaty with Portugal. The island of Tercera is the base for Coastal Command's operations. It was here, at the port of Angra, that a British landing party arrived on October the 8th, 1943, to begin the task of establishing a fully operational air base in just a little over six weeks. All equipment had to come by sea, machinery, food, a six-month supply of petrol, everything. The Royal Navy brought it and the Army and Air Force unloaded and used it. Near Angra, a base depot was established until the goods could be moved to the airdrome. From here, supplies were transported to the airfield, 18 miles away. Another important storage point, the petrol, oil, and lubricant supply dump. Guarding all this valuable material were troops of the Portuguese Army. The airfield at Largan 
lies in a natural valley about a mile and a half wide with a runway 2,000 yards long. Construction on the Largans Airdrome was begun by the Portuguese Air Force and completed by the British. A modern operations block was established, the Azores ACHQ, and wireless facilities for communication with coastal headquarters and with Gibraltar. The field began to function. Commander-in-chief at the Azores Area Combined Headquarters is Air Vice Marshal G.R. Bromit. As usual, working with him is a joint naval and air staff. Senior British Naval Officer is Commodore R.V. Holt. The aircraft flown from the Azores are Knife Wellingtons, Fortresses and Hudson. Their jobs, anti-U-boat patrols and convoy escort. Their service hangars, holes in a hillside. The American Air Transport Command also uses a field as a mid-ocean stopover point. A camp has been set up for American Army personnel and another camp by the United States Navy. With the Azores and the aircraft flown from them, the final gap necessary to complete coverage of the North Atlantic by air has been closed. These are coastal commands and its linking bases. And these are the main Atlantic convoy routes for whose protection they were established. How coastal bases are used can best be illustrated by the factual history of one particular convoy, one bound from Gibraltar to the United Kingdom. These ships had brought troops and supplies into the Mediterranean, had landed them in Italy, and were now about to return to England to be used in the supply line to France. They were world-wise, war-wise ships, battle veterans of the sea. Some had been crippled in Mediterranean action and would have to remain behind. A freighter split into two parts and now awaiting salvage. A stern gouged out by a torpedo. A tanker hit by a bomb that passed through four layers of steel before exploding. But the rest were fit and ready. Fifty vessels of many allied nations. Greek ships, Dutch, Belgian, French, American, British. Waiting with the merchantmen was their naval escort, which was to consist of two frigates, two sloops, three corvettes, and an armed merchant cruiser. And this was only a part of the total convoy. For another section was already sailing to meet it, up from Freetown in West Africa. Twenty-five more ships. These would unite with the others off Gibraltar, and they would then proceed to England together. Twenty-four hours before sailing time, the merchant skippers of the Gibraltar convoy assembled to be briefed for their journey. Like the ships they sailed, they too were veterans. On the board, each symbol represented thousands of tons of much-needed equipment. The officers of the Naval Control Service and the Naval Escort assured the merchant masters that their sloops and frigates would be guarding them day and night against the U-boats. And Coastal Command's representative indicated the air cover to be provided, but they would only see part of it. And finally, the Admiral, the C&C Gibraltar. Good voyage and good luck. Even as this briefing was in progress, Coastal Command's Hudsons were already going into action. Tomorrow, the convoy would be passing through the Straits of Gibraltar, always a danger zone. Lee Light Wellingtons maintained patrols throughout the night. Meanwhile, the convoy prepared to sail, to sail from Gibraltar, where German eyes and ears were spying from the Spanish mainland. They knew this convoy, so they passed the word on by wireless to U-boats at sea, through France to the U-boat bases along the Bay of Biscay. But the staff in the war room was equally on the alert. Whatever plans the U-boats might be making, the Navy and Air Force would have to have a plan to circumvent them. Then, in the gray light of dawn, the great mass of ships began to steam out. An army marching onto a battlefront thousands of miles in breadth and fathoms deep.
beginning of the journey was uneventful enough. Through the straits, the daylight close escort provided by two Hudsons. Then, while the convoys were making their rendezvous, escort by three more Hudsons. No U-boats yet. In fact, there was no indication of a U-boat for five days, and so no close escort was given. No routine patrols have been carried out both from Gibraltar and the Azores, as well as from bases in Britain. For although the Mid-Atlantic was a U-boat's chosen battlefield, the Bay of Biscay was their arsenal. It is over a thousand miles from this Sunderland flying boat station in southwest England, Mount Batten on Plymouth Bay, the waters through which the convoy was passing, but the Sunderlands and their Royal Australian Air Force crews were fighting to protect the convoy too, by carrying the battle to the enemy. Below them, the Bay of Biscay, and in it U-boats trying desperately to get out into the Atlantic to join the assembling pack. Every U-boat forced to submerge in the bay during this period and thus lose speed was one less enemy for the convoy. Every U-boat sunk, and there were at least four, meant a plus factor in our ship's safety. A Wellington, on night patrol from the Azores, found positive evidence that U-boats were lurking in wait for the convoy. At that time, just turning on its northerly course, the U-boat was attacked and damaged, but managed to dive. That same night, the convoy summoned its first casualty, an escort sloop, stern blown off by a U-boat's torpedo. This was enough for the Azores staff. HR had struck. The battle was on. The first and immediate step was to supply close escort again, four Hudsons. The Azores base began really to pound now, and it kept pounding. There was no rest for aircraft or crew or for the enemy. While the medium-range Hudsons were over the convoy, a flood of nine long-range fortresses were sent to do daylight sweeps far ahead of it. One was directed to return to the convoy, and there it found that a second sloop had been slightly damaged. Signals were flashed. The fortress. Was it a sub? The sloop. Yes. We attacked. He disappeared. Even before the fortresses had returned, another flood of 11 Lee Light Wellingtons relayed off to do night sweeps. One was on its way to the patrol area when, at 2.40 in the morning, it had a radar contact. Five minutes later, it saw a U-boat in the moonlight and attacked it. That's the second attack on the U-boat, and one later conceded to be probably sunk. The sixth day out, the convoy was now beyond the Hudson's range, but it was still in the danger zone, minus two of its surface escorts. So a series of fortresses took over the escort task. Ten fortresses. One sighted a fully surfaced U-boat, but it submerged before an attack could be made. A few hours later, the same fortress encountered and damaged a Yonkers 290, the first enemy aircraft sighted in the convoy's vicinity. The convoy was now approaching the limit of even the Azores fortresses. Coastal headquarters, which had been following the battle, began to call on its British bases. The next 48 hours would be the most critical. On the seventh day out, very long-range liberators from St. Evel began to give close escort, dovetailing with the last of the fortresses. There were 12 of these liberators over the convoy at staggered intervals. They sighted two U-boats, which quickly submerged, and attacked another. Six U-boats sighted so far, and three attacked, one probably fatally. The Germans now decided that perhaps their long-range aircraft might be more successful in getting at the prize. So on this seventh day out, attacks were made by no less than five thankful 177s at one time, dropping glider bombs, and by two Fock Wolf 290s using ordinary bombs. The Liberators accounted for at least three, probably damaged. Of the 12 Liberators, three returned to the English base while seven went on to Gibraltar. But Coastal had long practiced the shuttle bombing technique. There were two casualties. One Liberator failed to return, and another ditched with only the captain saved. The eighth 
day out. Far to the north, another coastal station entered the battle. Castle Archdale, a Sunderland station on a lake in Northern Ireland. Three of these flying boat crews were dispatched for close escort. And the liberators also continued. Six of them from St. Evel and one from Ballykelly, another Northern Ireland station. A U-boat was sighted and forced under, but the major battle on this eighth day was against enemy aircraft and their glider bombs, and the sky was alive with them. Seven FW-200s attacked simultaneously, four Heinkel 177s, and all were fought off by our air escort. The ninth day out, coastal still poured on close escort aircraft, seven liberators from Bally Kelly and two from St. Evel. But only one enemy aircraft was sighted and attacked, and no U-boats. Twelve days after the convoy left Gibraltar, it broke up with various British ports. The battle had been won, and our losses had been incredibly small. Two escort vessels damaged, two aircraft lost. One 4,000-ton ship damaged by enemy aircraft. Not even one U-boat had managed to attack a merchant ship. Coastal had flown about 700 hours on close escort and over 1,000 hours on offensive anti-U-boat patrol. I still rate highest among the dangers we have overcome, the U-boat attack upon our shipping, without which we cannot live, or even receive the help which our dominions and our grand, generous American ally have sent us.